In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with you. Brothers and sisters, as we gather to celebrate the Eucharist, we begin as always by first acknowledging our need for forgiveness, and our Father's infinite eagerness to forgive. Lord Jesus, you are mighty God and Prince of Peace. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Son of God, Son of Mary. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are Word made flesh and splendor of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth.
the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and elders of the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast to his son. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. A second time he sent other servants, saying, Tell those invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and fattened cattle are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged and sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. Go out, therefore, into the main roads, and invite to the feast whomever you find. The servants went out into the streets, and gathered all they found, bad and good alike, and the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he saw a man there, not dressed in a wedding garment. The king said to him, My friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he had reduced his silence. Then the king said to his attendants, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the darkness outside, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. First, I just want to thank um, those who are seated in the lobby area. Um, this is a very happy problem as our numbers are growing. Uh, we've had to expand some seats, so thank you for your patience and understanding. One of my favorite places to go in the summer is an area called Ocean Beach. Some of you might know Ocean Beach. It's one of the communities over on Fire Island. You take the ferry from Bayshore and you go out to Ocean Beach. We actually have a, a church there, uh, Our Lady of Magnificat. And I love whenever I have an opportunity to go out there and uh, cover uh, for even a few days or a few weeks and um, say mass there. It's, it's a little patch of paradise. Um, there are no cars over there except for emergency vehicles, so everyone just walks around. It's a really, it's a casual, fun beach area. Some people um, have summer homes there, others come for uh, a weekend or a week or something. It's just a really fun place to be. And um, again, because it's your steps from the beach, it's a very casual kind of environment. You know, nothing, no frills and stuff. It's just a really nice, relaxed beach environment. But there are a couple of rules when it comes to dress code. Um, and that is in the main, I'll, I'll call it the main room, you know, this main section, just the, when you get off the ferry, there's a, a stretch of, of area where there are some stores and restaurants and all, and this is the only area where, you, where if you're a guy, you have to be wearing a shirt. If you're wearing a bathing suit, you gotta at least be wearing a shirt. And ladies, the, you can be wearing a bathing suit, but just like not like a, like a bikini sort of thing. You have to wear like shorts and a, a shirt or something. Just in this one area. Other than that, people are at the beach, at their homes, no problem. But just in this one area, you have to just be a little bit more modest. Not a big deal, at least in my estimation, I don't think anything of it. I remember this one time, a few summers ago when I was there, I was at one of these uh, stores, like a grocery store that also had a deli. And I was um, getting some stuff, so the kid behind the counter was taking some time just to, you know, cut the, the cold cuts and whatever it was. So I was kind of standing near the door, and I watched this scene unfold. There were this group of guys, probably like in their 20s or so, and they obviously come from the beach. I don't think any of them were wearing a shirt. And they were coming into the town, and I assume they were going to probably this grocery store or someplace else to grab something. But obviously they didn't know the rule. And they didn't have anything with them. They didn't have like a towel or uh, a shirt over their shoulder. They just were walking in their bathing suit. And there was a, a cop standing there. And he saw them, and he very politely came up and said, guys, sorry, you have to be wearing at least a shirt if you're gonna walk down here. They weren't thrilled with that response. Um, and they made it known they were not excited 
about that rule. So there's a little bit of back and forth and stuff, and they were generally, generally respectful. Uh, the cop was too, he was very, very polite, very professional, and um, most of the guys kind of just turned around and were like, all right, all right, and they realized they had to walk back, you know, gosh, 100 steps back to the beach and grab their shirt or whatever and come back. But there was one guy who really was obstinate. I mean, he was, he just wanted to make his point, you know? And he was going back and forth with the cop about how stupid this rule was. And again, the cop was being very polite and all and, and, and being very clear. And at one point, you could tell that the cop had reached this point. Like, we were done discussing this now. And I'll never forget, he kind of didn't shout at him, but spoke very firmly and said, you are part of this community. You're not in charge of this community. I thought that was... That was it. That was very succinct. You are part of this community, but you're not in charge of this community. The gospel that we hear tonight can be a little bit of a confusing one. It has a parallel in St. Luke's gospel as well, but, but St. Matthew's telling of it can be sometimes admittedly confusing or even uh, make us scratch our head and wonder, what's up with Jesus in this parable? Because he tells a, a story that doesn't seem very kind. And most of Jesus' parables are really awesome. They, they, they depict God as amazing, as healing, as loving, and forgiving. And yet in this gospel, this parable that Jesus tells, the story may not seem that way. It's important for us to remember there are two sections of this parable, the story. And they are intertwined. One depends on the other. So Jesus is trying to make two points. The first one has to do with the first part of the story. The king has announced a great feast. Now, again, put your first century Palestinian hats on, okay? It was a big deal when there was this holiday or celebration thrown by the king or by the emperor. It was a big deal. Because most people lived maybe at the poverty line, usually much lower. So when there was going to be a feast to celebrate something, like the king has a child or something, or there was a wedding of a, of a, of a royal member of the royal family, it's a big deal. So right there, people should be alert. He goes to great lengths to make sure it's going to be an amazing feast. He's preparing, he's got uh, all the, the meat prepared. It's going to be a big, important, joyous celebration. And he sends out his servants to go and find the guests, to invite everyone. Now, this is kind of like one of those command performances, you know? Um, I know for me, sometimes you, you get a phone call and you, you know, the bishop's going to be, you know, in the neighboring parish and he wants to have the priest together for dinner or something. And you may have already had plans, but when the boss asks you for dinner, you clear your calendar, you know, whatever it is, you know? It's a command performance, you know? I'm sure we've all had that experience where we had one idea, but something comes that, that is really important, it's non-negotiable, you gotta be there. Well, that's how it was when the king summons you for this feast, this celebration. And yet we're told that there are people who ignore it, who just don't care. The king himself has invited you to a feast in his palace. But we're told that some go to check a farm that they bought. Some go to check in on their business to look at their books. Some go here or there. Like, not even close. Not even close. And we're told that the king is enraged by this. And you know what? Rightly so. The king wasn't inviting everyone to come to a torture fest or come to an obstacle course where you might die. He wasn't inviting them to something like crazy. He was saying, come to my house, come to this feast that I have prepared for you. Come without cost, come without pain, come as my guest. And people ignored it. God has presented himself, has revealed himself to us. And he invites us 
to a feast. He invites us to something that is amazing. Life in abundance. And we have the choice. We can either go or not. We can either accept the invitation or we can reject it. The hard truth is there are some who have rejected God, who have rejected the king's invitation, who for whatever reason or for whatever distraction do not count it as important, necessary. And so they excuse themselves and don't go. Now, it's our job to reach out there, to go like the servants to the highways and byways and bring people in, to bring people to God. All of us here, by virtue of baptism, are called to be prophets out there in the world, trying to attract people to the reality, to the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. That's not just my job, or Deacon Frank, or Deacon John's job, or Deacon Frank's job, or nuns and brothers. Important as our role is, for sure, it's our job, everyone here. So the second point, because we might start to think, well, I'm here, or I'm joining in prayer remotely. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I know I need to. I'm checking the box. But is that enough? See, the second part of the gospel, the second part of this story that Jesus tells, might make us even more confused. The king finally has everyone and anyone, anyone who wants, in his palace. They're celebrating, enjoying, feasting. And the king comes in, and you can imagine everyone stopping, looking, acknowledging the king, and him going around and greeting everyone. And he sees this person who's not wearing the customary garment, the customary clothing that would be expected at a wedding. Now again, we might scratch our head and say, wait, Jesus talks about, you know, the poor and the destitute, come as you are, you know, looking out for those who are on the outskirts. Maybe this guy didn't have the money for it, maybe he didn't know. We can say, like, what is, like, why is Jesus being mean in this parable? It's not a matter of Jesus or the king being mean, not at all. Not at all. Jesus is underlining the point that when you come to the feast, you're coming to the king's feast, the king's palace. It's not your palace. You're not the king or the queen. In other words, the key here is conversion. We can talk about that first group of people who reject the king's invitation, and we know that they need conversion. They need to realize and change their mind, change their way of thinking, change their hearts, and come to the feast that God has prepared. But those who do come, those who are here, it's a lot more than just checking a box, punching a car, moving on. No. It's about ongoing conversion. When we come into the King's presence, we're meant to be changed by His presence. When we encounter Jesus Christ, we're meant to be changed. And that change sometimes is uncomfortable. It might force us to change the way we think or the way we behave. And you know what? That's good. Discomfort can be good. It can remind us that we're not entirely there, not yet, that we're still imperfect, we're still in need of, of change. The man who was obstinate, reduced to silence, had no defense for why he wasn't wearing a wedding garment. He just chose that. But you can't. Being a disciple, going to the king's feast, means that we want to serve the king. We want to show our allegiance to him. That we want to change and make our lives more like the king's, more like God. And it's not always easy. In fact, sometimes it's downright difficult and uncomfortable. The great Catholic author, C.S. Lewis, once remarked about this principle of discipleship. He said, I didn't go to religion 
to make myself comfortable. I always knew a bottle of wine could do that. He said, if you're looking for a religion to make you comfortable, then I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Put it another way. If we're here, if we're listening to the scriptures, if we're opening our hearts more and more to God, week after week, day after day, and if we're moving along fine and not uncomfortable, if we don't feel that nagging feeling to, to change, then maybe we're not really hearing the gospel. Maybe we're not really serious about discipleship. If we're not feeling some desire some shove to change, to change more into being like God. And again, it's not always easy or comfortable, but it is necessary. I think about those knuckleheads at Ocean Beach. Some of them just walked away. They didn't care about the requirements, and so they just went off and did their own thing. And that one guy who just stood there and fought and fought and wanted it his way. Maybe we need to be reminded of what that cop said, of what the king says to us. You are part of this community. We are part of the kingdom. We are not the ones who decide. We are not the kings and queens. We are meant to conform our life to become more like the one we say we serve.
and for Gregory Villa, Nevi Lacayo, Frank Delaglio, and Anthony Bonoro, for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord I pray to the Lord. Lord. Merciful God, hear the prayers we offer to you. Increase with us the spirit of trust in your providence for our lives. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. holy nation, 
a people for your own possession, to proclaim everywhere your mighty works. For you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so, with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. We 
dare to say,
Let us pray. We entreat you, your majesty, most lovely, O Lord, that as you feed us with the nourishment which comes from the most holy body and blood of your Son, so you may make us sharers in his divine nature, who lives and reigns forever and ever. In addition to the 9 a.m. Mass, there will be one additional Mass at 7 p.m. It will be preceded by the Rosary at 6.30 p.m. for the intention of a greater respect for all life. After the Mass, there will be individual blessings with the relic of St. Gerard. Next Sunday, there will be a second collection for World Mission Sunday. Please make checks payable to the propagation of the faith. Our parish office will be closed Monday, October 12th, in observance of Columbus Day. However, the thrift shop will be open on Monday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Please see the flyer in the bulletin for special Columbus Day sale information. As many of you uh, probably heard this week, our uh, parish community and this uh, wider community suffered a tremendous tragedy. Uh, we prayed during the intercessions for uh, the repose of the soul of Patrick Huber, uh, a young man child in our religious education program, 10 years old. Um, so in your charity, uh, please keep his family in your prayers. I, I know you will already. Uh, but also keep uh, the wider community, his teachers. Uh, he went to the school just down the road here. Uh, the faculty and staff there, his classmates and all. This is one of those moments uh, that brings the community together. Um, for a terrible reason, nevertheless, tremendous grace is possible in the midst of this very dark moment. Uh, pray for us here at St. Gerard's, myself, Deacon John, Deacon Frank, uh, for the pastoral staff here that we're able to respond um, in, in ways that can bring some measure of healing and hope amid this. Um, I'm not sure we need to pray so much for Patrick that we can, but uh, I think we've already gained an intercessor for us here at our parish. So let's please keep the Huber family in our prayers. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.